Good morning everybody. There we are. Good clean water. Using bottled water because it's better than um, tap water. Good. Okay. So, so if I asked what were the qualities of this water, how would we describe it? We could say it's liquid, uh, it's clear, transparent, it's wet, it's runny, it will run through your fingers if you try and hold on to it. Uh, it's odourless, it doesn't smell of anything. And there's a whole load of other words you could use to describe the water, I'm sure. This particular water is chilled. I've just bought it from uh, a shop with a refrigerator, uh, refrigerator, a refrigerator unit. Um, yeah, no, okay. So I'm just going to put a little bit of that in there. Okay, so there's, I'm going to make a mess here, as you can see. Um, so there's a little bit of that water. Now, if I were asked to ask you to describe this water, how would you describe this water? Well, you'd say the same thing probably. You'd say it's clear, transparent, wet, runny, liquid, odourless, chilled, exactly the same. Because this water is a portion of that water. Yeah, it's the same thing. I've just taken a, um, a fraction of it, a fractal, a fragment, a portion of that water and it's exactly the same. And then again, if I were to use a little bit of this water, there we are, I've got a tiny little bit in there, I don't know if you can see that, there we are. Now if we were to describe the qualities of this water, again, it's wet, liquid, transparent and odourless. Okay, so saying that, there we are, let me just top that up a little bit. Yeah, let me grab a chair. So if I were to ask, what is the Bible? Or to describe the qualities of the Bible, what is the Bible? Um, we could say it's the truth, it's absolute truth. It's the word of God, it's the living word. It's Jesus. It's inspirational instructional, educational, and a whole load of other words. I mean, everyone's going to describe it slightly differently, but it comes down to the same thing, really, that it's the truth, it's the word, it's eternal, and it leads us to Jesus Christ. Okay, so if we were then to take... <laughs> this is where it's going to get messy... If we take a book from the Bible, you can see it's going to have the same qualities. Okay, the book from the Bible is still going to have those qualities. It's going to be truth, eternal, the living word of God. It's going to lead us to Jesus Christ. It's going to be inspirational, educational, instructional. Exactly the same because it's a portion of of the Bible. The book is a portion of the Bible and we can do the same thing again. We can take say for example a chapter from the book. Same qualities has to hold because it's the absolute truth. If something's absolute truth then any portion of it whether it be the chapter or the book, the chapter, the verse and we could go on breaking this down it would still hold true it would still hold it doesn't matter which book this is 
This can be any book in the Bible there. All books in the Bible direct us to Jesus Christ and ultimately to salvation. Okay. Just before we go on, I'd like to make a quick observation here. Now, Satan can't touch Jesus. Satan has no power over Jesus whatsoever. Jesus defeated Satan. He refused to be tempted by Satan in the wilderness. Ultimately, he defeated Satan on the cross when he shed his blood for our sin. Even the majority of atheists will admit that Jesus was here in the flesh. So if Satan has no power over Jesus, who does he come after? He comes after the prophets, the disciples and the apostles. We see that time and time again with the attacks on Paul. They all come after Paul and the attacks are severe. Their attacks on Paul's writings. Satan wants to twist the scripture and undermine the authority of Paul in Christ. Most Christians know the words of Jesus really well. Most Christians can tell you what Jesus actually said. But when it comes to Paul, people are a little less informed. And Satan uses this little chink, a little chink in the armour, to come after Paul to twist the scripture. The prosperity people do it. They twist Paul to be a collector of thieves and taxes from the church. They set about a confusion about Paul's teachings and it relies on people not knowing scripture. The prosperity people, the Hebrew roots, the feminists, they all come after Paul. If we look at the disciples, well, there's a gospel of Thomas, a gospel of Judas, a gospel of Mary. Like Paul, Mary Magdalene comes under severe attack. She's either belittled to the status of whore, or she's elevated to be somehow especially favoured to the point where she sets up a relationship with Jesus. Just like Satan has to go through Eve to get at Adam, he goes through Mary to get at Jesus Christ. Thomas and Judas both had weaknesses. Thomas the doubter, Judas the thief and betrayer. In the Gospel of Thomas, Thomas is accredited as saying that self-knowledge will give you power in the world. That's the doctrine of Satan. It's straight from Satan's lips. It's to take you away from the salvation of Jesus Christ. And it sets out to cause confusion as to who the disciples really were. Satan has no power over Jesus, so he attacks the disciples. And if we go back further, we'll see how the prophets are attacked. Both Enoch and Elijah were taken out of here by the hand of God and put directly into the kingdom. And Satan hates that. Satan, who was cast out of heaven, never to return, absolutely hates Enoch and Elijah. Make no mistake about that. We see a continuous, relentless, hard-driven war today between the spirit of Elijah and the spirit of Jezebel. That Jezebel spirit is here because Satan hates Elijah. And it's the Jezebel spirit that is the tool that Satan uses to exact revenge on Elijah for being so favoured by God, for being a prophet, for proving wrong the priests of Baal. As for Enoch, again Enoch was taken out of here. He didn't die a physical death, he was put straight into the kingdom, highly favoured highly favoured and Satan hates that. Enoch goes so far back into antiquity that it's really difficult one way or the other to prove one thing or another. 
We don't have any detailed life story, whether he wrote things down, whether the scriptures were saved or not. And so he becomes a target for Satan through the book of Enoch. Okay, this... This is the book of Enoch. Now I've put some um, kitchen towel down because this could get messy. <laughs> okay, here's our Bible. Here's the book of Enoch. Okay, and people who use or promote the book of Enoch will tell you that it aligns with scripture, that it's instructional, that it's useful. They'll tell you all sorts of things like this, but we're gonna have a look at how this works, okay? So, does the Book of Enoch line up with scripture? Well, apparently, and we're gonna have a look at the, we'll look at the scripture later. Let's take our book here. This is one of our books from the Bible. Now, apparently it does line up with, um, I believe it's the Book of Jude, okay? But this can be any book, it doesn't really matter. Um, people will say that the book of Enoch lines up with one of the books from the Bible. I think it might be Jude or maybe it's Old Testament, Ezekiel or something. We'll look at those scriptures later. Now, okay, I'm guessing this is food colouring. <laughs> Although it may not be. Let's have a look. I can't get this camera to focus on the ingredients. Okay. But when we actually look at the book of Enoch, what it doesn't do is it doesn't point to Jesus. Now, every other book, whatever book this is, whether it's Jude, Genesis, Ezekiel, it doesn't matter. Any All books in the Bible will take us back or have a fractal or a fraction or a portion of the overall truth which is to lead us to Jesus Christ and ultimately to salvation. Okay, we've just put a tiny little portion from Enoch now into our Bible. Okay, into our book of Jude. Mix it all up a bit. Now. There's our alignment. There's our alignment from the book of Jude, from the book of Enoch into the book of Jude, I believe it is. And you can see that now this is no longer the same as this. It looks completely different. Okay. Let's go and have a look at the scripture before we come back to this. Okay, so we are going to look at the scripture. Um, we're going to start with a verse from Deuteronomy. We're going to look at the book of Jude or the epistle of Jude. And we're going to look at the verse in question from the book of Enoch. So, you know, I understand that if you don't want to particularly see the verse from the book of Enoch for whatever reason then I understand that um, but just to warn you we will look at that verse as well it is necessary to compare these just to make the point about this okay okay so Deuteronomy chapter 33 and it's verse 2 we're looking at and he said the Lord came from Sinai and rose up from Seir unto them he shined forth from Mount Paran, and he came with ten thousands of saints. From his right hand went a fiery law for them. Okay, so of course this is from the writings of Moses. Now the book of Jude. Okay, and from the book of Jude, verse 14 and verse 15, Jude 1, there's only one chapter in Jude. Um, so from these two verses. And Enoch also, the seventh 
from Adam prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Okay, you'll see that these verses here absolutely correspond to Deuteronomy 33.2 yeah, which talks about uh, the Lord rose up and came with his ten thousands of saints from his right hand went a fiery law for them yeah which according to Jude Enoch prophesied the Lord cometh with ten thousand of his saints to execute judgment upon all okay those absolutely line up there and then we're going to go into the book of Enoch just this one particular verse verse 9 here uh, and behold he cometh with his sorry he cometh with 10,000 of his holy ones to execute judgment upon all and to destroy the ungodly and to convict all flesh of all the works of their ungodliness which they have ungodly committed and of all the hard things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him yeah, this absolutely lines up as well. So the epistle of Jude says that Enoch prophesied, prophesied of all this year, the Lord coming with his 10,000 saints, etc. Moses in Deuteronomy, we need to add verse 1 to this actually. And this is the blessing wherewith Moses, the man of God, Bless the children of Israel before his death. And he said, this is Moses speaking, okay. And he said, the Lord came. He came with 10,000 saints and brought a fiery law for them, okay. From his right hand went a fiery law for them, okay. The book of Enoch claims to be speaking for Enoch he claims to be a, a, a scripture from Enoch so if if Enoch had written this thing down in scripture it would have needed to have gone you know to have the book of Enoch that uh, exists now these writings would have had to go upon the ark with Noah okay now there's no mention of Noah taking scripture on the ark from Enoch who was his great-grandfather I believe um, yes his great-grandfather um, there's no mention of it anywhere in Genesis of Noah taking or salvaging scriptures from anybody Yeah, Moses wrote the book of Genesis. It's the divine inspiration of God. We know that Moses had had encounters with God. Yeah, when he was given the commandments, and he put the commandments down on stone and brought them down to the people. Jude receives the inspired word of God and he's clearly instructed to write this down that Enoch did indeed prophesy these events with the 10,000 saints okay um, so it's all there it's all there in the Bible this uh, Enoch Enoch chapter 1 verse 9 is in the Bible See, so there's absolutely no need to take this from an outside source and try and line it up with anything. It's there, it's in the Bible, it's here. Yeah, and this is what they do. They they say, ah, well, parts of 
parts of the book of Enoch line up with scripture? Well, so what? It doesn't matter. The authors of the book of Enoch have taken this out of scripture and inserted it into the book of Enoch. So what? <laughs> what about the other 99.9% .9 of the book of Enoch that doesn't align with scripture? Yeah, it's poison. Because you're going to line this up with scripture, then you're going to, which is going to open you up to bringing in other things and you're adding to the word of God. Although this particular verse in Enoch doesn't add to, particularly add to the word of God. What about the rest of it? Yeah. What about Enoch chapter 2, 3, 4, 5 uh, verses chapter, uh, and the other books? Yeah. All this stuff. So the Jewish people do not accept that, do not accept the book of Enoch to be authentic. They do not include uh, the book of Enoch in their, in their scriptures, in their teachings, and neither should Christians. Um, they're not accepted as divinely inspired, God-given word of God. And you'll see that there's no, they don't hold true with the books of the Bible because they don't point to Jesus. They don't point to the cross or to the salvation that's offered to us. Okay, so what we know is that the Bible always leads us to Jesus. It doesn't matter which book of the Bible it is and pretty much any chapter of any book of the Bible, even a verse is always pointing toward Jesus, pointing towards salvation. Whereas the book of Enoch, if we look at the ingredients again, Jesus isn't listed in the ingredients there. There's no Jesus, there's no salvation in the book of Enoch. It doesn't lead you to Jesus, yeah? And because it doesn't lead you to Jesus, this cannot be of this. This cannot be a fractal or a portion or a fraction of our drinking water there. Okay, so what we're going to do okay so we've got the scripture there it's um, Enoch 1 verse 9 there so this is what they're going to do they're going to mix Enoch 1 9 in with Jude 1 verses 14 and 15 yeah okay and that's what you get something that doesn't look very much like the Bible anymore um, now, one verse, one verse from the book of Enoch, one verse from the book of Enoch, they're saying, aligns with the Bible. Now, what about, so there's our verse, mixed in with Jude or Deuteronomy or wherever. What about this? What about this that could be food colouring, could be cyanide or arsenic or something? What about that? What, what, where does that leave this? Yeah. I would drink this. I would drink this. I would give this to the children to drink. Yeah. Because I know where it's come from. I know where it's come from, what it is. Yeah. Would you drink that? Would you drink that? Some people are willing to drink this. Like I say, it might be food colouring. Yeah. Who's going to drink this? This is what they want you to drink. Yeah. One verse gives you this. And there's the rest of the book of Enoch. It doesn't look too appetising to me. I could be wrong. Well, I'm not wrong. It doesn't look appetising at all. Um, now, the book of Enoch was probably written by five different authors yeah, and it's accredited to sometime between 
300 years before Christ and the first or second century after Christ, okay, by five different authors. There's five distinctly different writings in the book of Enoch, okay. Now, this is the next thing we do, okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to take uh, verse Deuteronomy verse uh, Deuteronomy chapter thirty three verse two that we've just studied. That's that there, okay. And the book of Jude, chapter one, two verses there, fourteen and fifteen. Okay. Those are our Bible verses. We'll mix them up a little bit there. Okay. Again, exact same quality as our Bible because this is in the Bible. It's true. It's truth. It's truth. It directs us to Jesus Christ and to salvation. We're going to take that. In fact, we're not going to take that out of the Bible. Let's just put that back in the Bible for a moment. What we're going to do is we'll do a copy and paste job. Okay. So there's our Deuteronomy 33.2 and our Jude 1, 14 and 15. Yeah, we're going to leave the original verses in the Bible. We don't want to remove those. They're in the Bible. They belong there. They're eternal. Okay, so we're just going to copy and paste those verses now. And we'll add those to the book of Enoch. Now, there's our book of Enoch. Yeah, which has obviously clearly taken those verses, they've been put into the book of Enoch and put together they form Enoch chapter 1 verse 9, yeah, and there's the complete book of Enoch then, yeah, with some scripture taken from the Bible put into the book of Enoch now. Well, that's going to be okay then, yeah, surely. <laughs> Surely that's good to drink now. That's good to go, right? No, <laughs> that's not right at all. This is, this is your drinking water. Okay, that's your Bible. There's your Book of Enoch. That is not of that. Otherwise it would look the same. Yeah. And this is what your Gnostics want you to drink. Yeah, they want to put more and more of this into their wine well at best yeah at best if you start aligning Enoch with the Bible at best you're adding to the word yeah but worse than that you're opening a gate where you're going to start bringing in verses from the Gospel of Thomas the Gospel of Mary, the Gospel of Judas, yeah, all these other books that do not point to Jesus Christ and salvation. This is your gift. These are the eternal living waters. Yeah, your gift from God. This is the knowledge, the education, the inspiration, the instruction, the truth that God wants you to have, to drink from daily, yeah. If God had intended this to be green and stagnant and stale and filthy, well, he wouldn't have intended that at all. God doesn't intend such things, okay. Okay, well, we did that without too much mess as well, that's great.